Hello, my name is Jeff Deck. We are here tonight in the same place we always are for another reading from the Pseudo Chronicles of Mark Hunley. I may have just broken the fake fireplace, but uh, hopefully that's not the case. We'll, uh, we'll work on that next time. So I am going to be reading uh, an entry and a half, basically. We've got, uh, we've got a, a long entry coming up, and uh, it, it breaks uh, kind of neatly partway through. So we're going to get up to a good stopping point and then continue that entry tomorrow evening. Um, so uh, we're going to get into uh, the adventures that happen once uh, Mark's old friend arrives in town. So here we go. <clears throat> Excuse me. Friday, October 8th, 2004. Anticipating. Oh, hey, Buster. <laughs> Rents is coming down tonight in his rattly old Sentra. He didn't even balk at the thought of an eight-hour drive. Well, seven in my friend's hands. Turns out Rents would rather brave highway after highway than face up to his fear of flying. Sure, Rents has been on a plane before. That's how he knows that he hates it. One thing's for sure, I'm glad this week is over. A three-day weekend is a welcome reward. It was hell just to get through the monotony of work. As I was reading through articles and making calls, I found myself devoting the majority of my mental real estate to thoughts about knives and auras. That's been happening a lot lately. I can see why it's difficult for insane people to hold down jobs. I haven't mentioned a piece of news from a few days ago yet, in part because I'm not sure what to do with it, and in another part because I've started to have my doubts about the wisdom of keeping this journal, or this blog, or whatever you want to call it. I don't know who might actually be reading it. I don't know who you are, reader. Yesterday's entry, sure, that's probably all it's stuff that if the Aura people are reading this, they already know. The Purple Caterer would have reported my knife threatening back to Monster Cult headquarters, wherever that may be. But this other thing? I didn't want to advertise my intentions beforehand. So I got an email on Monday from someone with a Hotmail account calling themselves Bob McCammon. Obviously a pseudonym. Robert McCammon is the name of a famous novelist. I doubt the real McCammon would be sending me a message like this. Mark, we know you're going through a lot of confusion right now. There is a part of you that you don't understand. We would like to help you understand that part. But we must be discreet. There are others working against us. Many others. Please meet our contact tomorrow at 1 p.m. at the fountain in DuPont Circle. And please come alone. Contact will be alone as well. You will know him slash her when you see him slash her. Do not mention this online. Yeah, right. Less than 48 hours after I had the run-in with the papal... The, the papal, wow. The purple caterer. I get this message and Bob the Anonymous expects me to trust him? No way was I going to show up at that appointment. It was a trap. A trap set by the Aura people. Yet on Tuesday... I couldn't help but approach the circle on my lunch break. I wasn't going to go to the fountain, but I could keep a safe distance from it and not stand out. It wasn't a super warm day, but there were still plenty of people walking around in the afternoon. I crept as close as I dared to get. I had to assume that they knew me by sight. I hid behind one of the trees in the park, still a good distance away from the inner open circle, and peered at the area around the fountain. Oh, there was somebody who stood out, all right. It was a black woman with dreads in a colorful pink and blue dress, the pinks and blues amplified by the silver aura that surrounded her. I backed away from the tree and walked off quickly in case she had non-aura accomplices who were watching her and watching to see who watched her. I came back to work having forgotten to pick up lunch for myself, my hands shaking. Couldn't get them to stop shaking for a long time. Nobody noticed except for Deb, who diagnosed me with a case of skipping lunchitis. I haven't received any more emails from Bob, but uh, now I know they've moved beyond mere surveillance. They're trying to get me. And it seems like the purples and silvers are working together if this is a consequence of what I did at the wedding. 
Maybe it would be better if I just stopped posting here. Maybe I'm putting myself in danger. Then again, if they do kidnap and or dismember and or murder me, I want there to be as complete a record as possible left behind in public. I want everyone to know what happened. And if there's something other than human, which ever since I saw those things swimming around in that purple's aura, I fear is true, then I have a duty to let the world know that we've been um, infiltrated. This is your official notice then, capital O, capital N. I have the strong impression that there are non-human things walking around us wearing human faces. Well, just saying that doesn't accomplish much, I guess. Any ideas about what to do about it now? I'm fresh out of them myself. I'm hoping that Rents may have one, if I can convince him that I'm not out of my gourd first. I'm also hoping that I've made the right call and that I'm not putting an additional person in danger just by proximity to me. I almost called Rents to yesterday and told him not to come. But I don't want to face this alone. It's too late now to consider otherwise. Rents is on his way. I'll take what precautions I can, but the Aura people know where I live and haven't attacked me yet. The likelihood that they will this weekend must be small. I know that re keeping Rents both safe and entertained will take up a lot of my time, so I might not get the chance to write for a little while. I'll report as soon as I can on the hopefully benign adventures of Huntley and Robichaux. Posted by Mark Huntley at 5.48 p.m. So, this next one, it's, uh, it's got kind of a double title to it, and I'm basically going to be reading what the first part of the title covers. So, this is Last Call for Dinner slash First in Flight. It's Sunday, October 10th, 2004. Here comes a big one, and it's so nice I've titled it twice. I finally have some time to catch my breath. I've got a few more answers now, that's for sure but even more new questions to go along with them. I open one box and there's a smaller box inside. There's much I have to catch you up on, a series of strange adventures that I don't think are over. And poor Rents has been along for all of it. I don't think I can convince him to leave tomorrow, Columbus Day, as was his original plan. He's insisting on staying down here to help me figure out this whole puzzle. Not that I'm trying to get rid of him, I don't know where I would be now if he hadn't been here to help me keep a cool head. But I worry about his job security. He says that it's A-OK -okay with his employers if he stays a couple extra days down here south of the Mason-Dixon. I'm not entirely sure about that, though. I don't know a lot of bosses who shrug their shoulders at not-quite-justified extended vacations. All right. Well, to the beginning, then. Chronology, yeah. Getting that right will help me think better, too. Friday night. Rents had estimated he'd arrive around 7 p.m. or so. The plan was for him to show up, drop his stuff off in my apartment, and then we'd go for dinner in DuPont Circle so I could show off one of the many fine eateries in my hood. Unfortunately, since I hadn't seen Rents for almost a year, I'd forgotten about his disregard for traditional notions of timeliness. And true, you can't blame him for traffic snarls all the way down the East Coast. But it was almost 10.30 when my good friend showed up at my door with a sheepish grin and a bag full of excuses. Not to mention a bag from Wendy's with a few cold fries left in it, since he'd stopped for food along the way. By that time, I had eaten four of my own fingers and had started in on my thigh. Hey there, muchacho, he said. I have a cell phone, I said. We gave each other a hearty hug. And then I stepped back to take a good look at my friend, who had changed very little since last Christmas. Rents Robichaux is a couple inches shorter than me, and I'm no shack or wilt. But he makes more than makes up for it with muscle mass, far more than I could ever hope for. He has long, floppy, blonde hair that would look more appropriate on somebody from the other coast. His eyes are deep brown. That night he was wearing his usual type of uniform, a green and blue plaid shirt over a white t-shirt and jeans. And, of course, docs. After we'd gotten through all our hellos and how are yous, I said, You want to sit a spell? That drive must have worn you out. And I was kind of tired myself after all that waiting. Hell no, Rent said. 
No sitting for me. I've been sitting for the past however many hours. Let's get into something. Take me out into the streets of this metropolis. Come on, you at least need some dinner, right? Uh, well, yeah. I couldn't deny that. I motioned awkwardly. If you need to make a pit stop or anything, it's over there. <laughs> pit stop, huh? He clapped me on the shoulder and said, smiling, Ah, my old friend, you're the same as you've always been, huh? Just uh, give me a minute. Oh, and Rents unzipped one of his bags and pulled out a wrinkled pair of khakis. Guess I'd better strap these on if we end up going anyplace halfway fancy. We're not in Beantown anymore, Toto. He switched to the voice of a character from the movie Groundhog Day. Am I right or am I right or am I right? Right, right, right. Rents and the khakis went into my bathroom and shut the door. A few seconds later, I heard the long, self-satisfied sound of a poop making a swim for it. No reaction from Jane on that one. <laughs> Good old Rents. I stopped smiling, though, as I remembered he would find out sooner or later that I wasn't the same as I'd always been. And that I, maybe I'd realign myself with the me of nine years old, but not any of the me's in between then and the very recent past. Rents emerged from the bathroom wearing the khakis. In spite of the relative warmth of the evening, he buttoned his plaid shirt up probably to hide the white t-shirt underneath. Let's-a go, he said. We headed out in the general direction of DuPont Circle. Along the way, Rent stopped in Scott Circle to admire the statue of Daniel Webster, the old hero of our home state. He also peered curiously at the statue on the opposite side, that of Samuel Hahnemann, a German who was a big proponent of homeopathy back when people thought echinacea was a, some kind of skin disease. I explained to Rents that D.C. has more random statues per capita than any major American city. I found myself really enjoying playing tour guide. It felt normal. Something I'd all but given up hope of feeling again. We strolled around the DuPont area for a bit. Rents gawked at the diverse array of people hanging around and enjoying their Friday night. I think he was surprised to see a lack of suits and sober dresses. People were out dressed in casual clothes and clubbing gear and just having fun. He'd just assume, like so many others who don't live here, I've assumed, that Washington is a stuffy, stifle place. And to be fair, in other areas at other times, it really is. After I'd let him enjoy his time at the circus for a while, I steered rents toward Thai Foon. I don't know if this is a common thing for Thai restaurants, but at this one, along the back wall, there are three booths and alcoves each alcove in a different bold color, green, red, and yellow. There were a surprising number of customers still eating here, and two of the alcoves were occupied. But one was open, the yellow one, and Rents wanted to sit there. We headed back that way with the hostess. Though the rest of the place was brightly lit, it felt dim inside the alcove. The dimness seemed to affect our conversation as we caught up on recent events in our lives, on my side with significant omissions. We still joked with, her, with each other, uh, Rents still trotted out more voices and impressions, but it all came out hushed, like we were in a library. At one point, Rents whispered, Why are we whispering? Still, our conversation gradually picked up speed as we chowed through our meals. We got to hear about Rents' re recent string of dates. Plenty of action, not so much follow-through. His craziest insurance biz stories. Hint, they only get so crazy and his trip out to Cape Cod this past summer with his older sister and her husband. I was proud of him. He'd built a good life for himself, a solid life. He had managed to leave his rocky past behind and not look back. Yes, we were having a famous old time right up until a gray-haired woman in a dark blue sweater and a tall black-haired man in a purple aura sat down at a table directly in front of our alcove for a late dinner. The rice noodles I'd been chewing dropped right out of my mouth. Hey, Mark, Rent said, peering at me. Mark, you, you just stopped in the middle of a sentence. My heart went a pump pump. My nose filled with the smell of something rotting. Strawberries, maybe. They smell terrible when they go bad. I mean, I don't know for sure. I'm not really a connoisseur of rot. Rents didn't comment on the smell if he could smell it, but I noted that he had pushed his plate away. Sorry, I said the courier was... L the Curry was a little spicier than I expected, and, you know, 
curry, spice. My eyes flicked back to the tall man in sickly violet. He caught me watching him and ret returned the stare. Nothing especially malicious there, just, what are you looking at, buddy? Did he know who I was? Couldn't be coincidence that he and his dining partner had chosen to sit right here in front of us. For he could easily grab me if I tried to burst out of the alcove. <laughs> Stupid of me to allow us to sit here where we could be so easily fenced in. Stupid of me to allow myself to think of this night as a normal one, with a little bit of sightseeing, a little bit of dinner. They were out to get me, and I fu fucking forgotten that. I... Right, said Rents. Do you need some water, maybe? Still have some left, I said, holding up my half-empty glass. I drank from it and wanted so badly to return my attention to the tall man. But I resisted the impulse, keeping my eyes fixed on Rents. Do you have a pen? Pen? Sure. As Rents dug in, dug in his pants pocket, I wondered, what did I need a pen for? My friend asked that same question as he handed it over. Just, uh, just need to write something down before I forget, I extemporized. Nothing important. Mystified by my own behavior, I pulled my paper napkin from my lap and folded it on the table, then uncapped Rents's pen and drew a symbol on the napkin. What the Christ was it? Like a Y, but not quite. Almost an upside-down gamma, but swirlier. I, I couldn't... No, I remembered this. One of the symbols from that, that armillary sphere that I'd drawn, calculating data points for some other world, not my own. It's one of those symbols that I had sketched over and over in a kind of trance in my apartment. During that creative frenzy of a kind that Lucy had never imagined or intended when she suggested I take, I take art classes. Rents didn't lean forward to look at the napkin, but he was curious about what I was doing. Since I lacked a good explanation myself, I hid the drawing from him. So, what were we saying about... You were telling me about a concert you went to in June, Rents said slowly. Right, that's right. I drew another funny upside-down gamma, then another. I slammed my hand down on the napkin, covering it. Then, absurdly, I drew a copy of the symbol right on my hand. I couldn't stop. The rotting smell faded into the background as I drew. It was down at the um, Birchmere. I drew a second one on my hand. Somehow I willed myself to direct the pen elsewhere. I scrawled the symbol on the tablecloth. Amigo, Rent said, watching me as I drew a second and then a third copy. I don't think they throw away these tablecloths. You know, they're not disposable. What? I said, distracted. I'm saying, how do they keep letting you back in here if you write all over the table? What the hell are you doing? You're right, I shouldn't be doing this, I said. I felt dazed, not entirely there. I started, started drawing the symbol on my pants. Rents glared at me. Are you trying to be funny or something? You have better material than this. He glanced sideways. The waitress is coming back here. He moved my plate to cover the symbols. She might have to wash the tablecloths by hand, you never know. He tried to smile, but something about the way I looked killed it. Our waitress, a slim, braid-haired Thai woman, appeared and asked if everything was good. The way her hands were placed on her thighs, I thought her hands would look quite nice decorated with the symbol. Quite nice indeed. I said, could I see your hand for a second? She looked confused. But she obliged because customer service is paramount, a paramount at Typhoon. And because we are often... So unwilling to deny simple requests from strangers in polite settings, the guerrilla marketer's trade secret. She held out one small hand in my direction. As I reached for it, Rance gave me a sharp kick under the table. I opened my mouth but managed to keep my pain quiet. He's just making a joke, Rance said quickly. He loves jokes. We're actually fine, thank you. She left. Rance gave me an accusatory look. You were going to draw on her hand, weren't you? Um, I just blinked. I couldn't put together a coherent answer. Rents' kick had jolted me back to my senses, thank God. I no longer felt compelled to draw the symbol. But I still had to say something. So tell me, what kind of joke has this been, Mark? He said. I'm feeling left out here. I don't get it. 
I hate to feel left out. Before giving him an answer, I glanced over at the tall man. He was giving me openly hostile looks whenever his dining companion's attention drifted elsewhere. His eyes kept drifting to the repeated symbol on my hand, on the napkin, on my pant leg. If he hadn't been my enemy before, he was now. What did that symbol mean to him? It's nothing. It's stupid, I said. Hey, can we get out of here? Rance looked down at his plate. Well, I did lose the rest of my appetite. Not sure why. I love the food. Okay, we can get the check. I got this one. Good. Thanks. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just being an asshole. No, Rance said. I know what being an asshole is like, and this is not it. We're going to need to talk once we're out of here. There's nothing to talk about. But my voice, my face. My face flamed with guilt even as I said this. Once we'd received the bill and rents paid for it, we stood up. I watched the purple carefully as we edged out of our seats to see if he would try to stop me from leaving. He was watching me, too, but he didn't make a move. In fact, as I walked by him, he actually flinched away from me. As we walked back towards the circle, rents pressed me for an explanation for my strange behavior. But it was after 11, I was tired, I just wasn't ready to get into it because once I started, I wouldn't be able to just stop after a few minutes. So I pretended that my tired state had led me to make dumb attempts at humor that I wouldn't have made otherwise. I shrugged off his concerns and got myself to make a huge yawn. All right, we can just head back to your place now, Rent said. But if you crap out tomorrow night and Sunday night too, I'm gonna have to seriously reevaluate our friendship. Underneath the sarcasm, I could hear his genuine worry. God, I hated that I'd made him worry before he'd even been here two hours. Couldn't I just enjoy some time with a friend without having to bury him under a stack of baggage? Even then, I realized the answer was no. Not anymore. We stayed up a little while longer back in my apartment, drinking Miller's, though I went through them twice as fast as Rents did, and laughing at late-night television. I promised Rents a more entertaining schedule the next day. I dragged out a futon for him that I'd had folded up against a wall, and I placed it in the living room, which is essentially where my bed is not. That night, I had a dream that I was walking along a beach next to a silvery ocean. I saw a beachcomber who was literally combing the beach with his hands. A big figure bent over and digging through the sand, muttering to himself, when I got closer to him, I realized that he wasn't muttering at all, but actually singing. The words were familiar. God, and is it time to go? Ah, the clock is always slow. He looked up at me, and his face was Dale's. It was full of gashes, as if from a knife. What's for lunch, he said. I woke up from the dream then with a horrible feeling. I crept over to the nearest window, careful not to wake rents on the way. I peered out, peer, prying the blinds open just to crack. Sure enough, my watcher was back, far below on the street, under the streetlight, staring up. This time, the purple aura around him was very clear to see. And this time, he wasn't alone. Three other people stood with him, making for a total of four watchers. I couldn't tell for sure, but I thought that one of them was the tall man from the Thai restaurant, and that another one was the woman from the Kerry campaign. They were standing still, not talking to each other, as if they didn't need to. I jerked away from the blinds, and I went to the door and made sure both locks were on. There was no point in moving the bookcase this time. Rents would hear any attempt to force open the door. The rest of the night passed. I slept in fits and starts, and no attempt was made. I told myself that the next day I'd find a time to talk to Rents, to tell him everything. I was almost positive that I would. So we'll pick up with the second half of that entry, the first in flight part of it uh, tomorrow. In the meantime, I bid you good night. Thank you all for tuning in. If you liked what you heard, uh, you can buy me a coffee or check out my books via the links in my Instagram bio. Or if you're watching this later on YouTube, uh, via the links in the description of the video. And uh, if you uh, want to check out the previous videos in the series, you can look at my YouTube channel where I've got uh, previous uh, 15 videos, I believe. I think this is number 16. So until then, until next time, 
take care of yourselves. Uh, stay in good health. Don't, uh, don't stand within six feet of other humans. And uh, I'll see you next time.